Thank you, thank you, thank you for praying. <coughs> okay, so they handed you an insert when you came in. You don't have to pull that out right now, but you're going to need that insert at the end, and you're going to need a pen. Today is a day that we're going we're gonna to teach you some things, and then we're going to make you work at the end of today's message. If you've not been with us for one of these messages before, uh, get ready. Um, but you are going to work, and it's going to be good. And if you guys are online, now's the time to get your paper and pen as well. You could go ahead and uh, maybe pause the stream and get that stuff, and you'll be ready at the end for it. Uh, now, some of you um, are detail-oriented, and you've already noticed the blue thumb. Um, so I'm just going to get it out of the way and explain why it's here. Um, so I'm secretly involved in an underground fight club. And, you know, I was just, I was feeling a bit much um, and took on a guy with just my thumb. It did not go well. I'm just, just joke. These are jokes. Um, the alternate story, if you choose to believe the alternate story, is that yesterday Linda and I were working on a wood project and I picked up a rubber mallet and swung as hard as I could and missed the board and hit my thumb. But I like the first story better. Amen? <laughs> Let's do that. Um, okay. We're in a series right now called Lasting Words. And it's the idea that the words that we speak, whether they're good or bad, whether they're life or they're death, they last. They get inside of us. They have a shelf life. Amen? So this got me thinking as we near the end of this series. It just got me thinking about the words that we say, but also the words that we don't say, the concept of silence and how silence messes with us. And as a pastor, I do funerals. And when I'm walking a family through some of the most difficult weeks of their life, when they're going through a funeral and they're approaching a funeral, a lot of times I'll meet with the family and I'll ask them about the person that, that they're missing right now, that, they're, that, they're, that, that, that has passed. And I'll ask them to write down the things that they love most about the person. And I'll ask them to write down the things that they admire and respect the most about the person that they just lost. Does that sound easy or hard to do? It's hard. <laughs> and it's hard during the easy times. But it's especially hard when that person, you've just lost them. But I, I encourage them, press through this. Because this moment comes only once. And when everyone gathers you want to speak the words that need to be spoken about this person. Yeah. You need to take the opportunity to speak the honor that must be spoken. And as hard as it is today, when you get to the other side of this, you will know you've been faithful. And, and sometimes I walk up to those funerals and I've got three pages of stuff that they've written. I've walked up there with 10 pages before. And you read that part and no one gets mad that the pastor is going long during that part because it's life-giving and we know it. And when I go through that and we get to the end of the funeral, the experience I often have after, after reading all of that life-giving stuff and, and, and the feeling that everybody has is, is it's a shame this wasn't said to them before. Amen. It's a shame that the honor wasn't spoken to them before. Now, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ today, you know that death is not the end. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ today, you know that for those who are in Christ, even if they've passed, if Jesus were here, he would say, they're just sleeping. They're just sleeping and they'll, they'll awaken again. And you'll be reunited with them again and the memories and the personalities will be intact and our, our fa family and friendship connections will be intact. And that's, that's what the word of God shows to us and tells us. And so it, when I say it's a shame it wasn't spoken, I don't say it's too late. I don't say that. But man, how much life could have been breathed into that person's daily existence if we'd have spoken the words earlier. Do you get what I'm saying today? Proverbs 27, 5 says this. It says, better is open rebuke than hidden love. The, the poetry of Proverbs always gets me. And it juxtaposes these two ideas. It's like, it's a bad day when somebody comes and rebukes you openly in front of other people, yes? 
calls you out. Like that's not fun. But even that's better than love that's secret, hidden, and unspoken. The love is there, but it never got said out loud. That's, that's the worst. Why is it the worst? Why is, why is silence, why is unspoken love so hard to deal with? I, I would submit this to you. I would submit that as human beings, many of us struggle with the concept that we are valuable. Most days we don't feel valuable. Most days we don't feel like much at all. And we forget like God's word comes in and says, like you're made in the Imago Dei, right? Like right from the beginning, regardless of your behavior, not only did Jesus die for you, but God breathed the breath of life into men and women and they became living souls. And when he did that, he said he was made in the image of God. She was made in the image of God. And so were all their descendants. And that means that we are stamped with the divine nature. Amen. We have dignity. Amen. We have value as people. Yes. But we forget. And God's word can say it. But a lot of times we don't walk in it. And why don't we walk in it? Ask yourself. Because, <laughs> because I know my failures because I know my screw-ups, I know my addictions, I know what's holding me back. And all those shortcomings are sitting there staring at me in the mirror every single morning. And I struggle to know I'm valuable. Come on, third service, or second service. Boy, I called you the wrong service. <laughs> we should just pray, be done. Just, just joking, just joking. We think we're nothing. And we need to speak words to each other to remind each other that there is value there. Maybe you grew up in a family where words weren't spoken. Or maybe the words tore you down. Or maybe it was just silence. And maybe dad and grandfather and mom and grandmother told you, we're just not that kind of people. We just don't speak the feelings. We don't do the hugs. Right? Like sometimes we make ourselves excuses. My grandfather fought in World War II, and he was Army, if that was important to you. Um, but he fought in World War II, and, and in the 1940s, he's, he's about to get on a train to go to boot camp because he fought in the European theater. And, and right as his mom and dad were setting him on the train, and his father hugged him and said he loved him. And when my grandfather told me that story decades and decades later, he said it was the first time my own dad had ever said he loved me. And it's so easy to think back to those older generations. That was 80 years ago. So easy to look back at those older generations and say, yeah, but they were so stoic and they didn't talk about their feelings and, and that was okay for them. It wasn't okay to my grandpa. Every single time he told the story, he said, he reminded me, it was the first time it had ever been said to him. And I just want to acknowledge before we go any further that, that, that what I'm messing with right now for some of you is very soft tissue. It's very difficult stuff. And we're reaching into family stuff and we're reaching into personality stuff. And, and for some of you, it is very difficult. It is very painful. It is very hard for you to feel confident about the words of encouragement and love that you speak to other people, but we need to speak them. Yes. For some of you, it's generational curse. The scripture talks about this. It says the sins of the fathers will be visited upon their children. And what I believe God is speaking about there when it says that in the Old Testament is that sometimes the life patterns of parents gets picked up by the kids. And then the life patterns of the kids get picked up by the grandkids. And it goes generation, generation, generation. Somebody's got to break it. And some of you want to break it today. Yes? Yes? And, and sometimes we're like, I'm going to do it different for my kids and I'm going to set a different thing in motion for my family. Can I just tell you, it's not just about church attendance. To really set something new in motion for your family, you got to change the life behaviors. You got to change the patterns and you got to make them more biblical. 
make them more, more biblical. And, and you get to break generational bondage. I've talked to people before who are like, I had to break generational bonds. And then I talked to people who are like, I got to break generational bonds. Be the second. Because it's a huge blessing if you're the one who gets to do that. So God is not a God of silence. God is a God of speaking. That might sound obvious. But let me just remind you of what your Bible tells you. It says right in Genesis chapter 1 that God came in and the earth was, was formless, right? Yep. That, that the universe was empty. And God came in and God did what? Spoke. You have a speaking God. Right, like I, I remember sitting in one of my theology classes for seminary and, and the professor was like, you can't get better than Genesis 1 because you see everything you need to know about God right there. Because so much about our humanity is about being distant and leaving things unspoken. God speaks. He can't help but speak. Like he's not going to come in and leave you with questions. He's not going to come in and leave you confused. He's not going to be distant, making you wonder how far away he actually is. Amen. And the song by Bette Midler from a distance. Nope. Nope, it's not. Nope, it's not. God is always rushing toward us and he's always speaking. <clears throat> Jesus Christ, when he came and was born in Bethlehem, him rushing to humanity, what was he called by John in John chapter one? The word, the logos. It's his nature to reveal. The New Testament says God in many ways was invisible and we didn't know exactly what he was like. And so Jesus came to speak and to show us exactly what God was like. His personality, his character. So he did not leave us in the void. God speaks. And then right away in Genesis, God rushes to a man named Abram. And God's got to tell Abram that he's going to have a son. And why does he tell Abram that he's going to have a son? Because they were infertile and they had no kids. But God uses this promise and he uses this miracle to do what? To build a relationship with Abram. And there's this little thing about Abram's name that'll kind of surprise you if you dig into it. Abram means father of many, and yet they were infertile. So every single time, little Abram's growing up, right? And he's in his 20s, he's in his 30s, he's in his 40s, he's in his 50s. What's your name, father of many? Where's your kids? Uh, that's rough. So God comes to him and says, I'm gonna rename you. I'm going to rename you from father of many to father of many nations. That's Abraham, father of many nations. Because you're going to have a son, but it's not going to be an ordinary son. And no ordinary line is going to come from him. The Messiah himself will one day come from your line, Abraham. And he renames Sarai into Sarah because Sarai is, I'm, I'm my princess, I believe. And Sarah is the princess. So she also gets a new name. God's a little equal opportunity there. I kind of love that. Romans 4.17 says that God gives life to the dead and calls those things which do not exist as though they did. I don't have that on the screen for you, but just hear that one again. Because the, the language is really, really important. God gives life to the dead. And that, that means to Abraham is what it's talking about. And he calls those things which do not exist as though they did. God comes in before it exists and God calls it out. God comes to Abraham before he's a father of many nations and he renames him before it happens. Because the way God does this stuff is God sees ahead and he sees the seed before it comes to full fruition and becomes a plant that you can see. Because that's the way that God speaks and that's going to be really important because he does the same thing for Jacob. He does the same thing for Peter in just a minute. But first, before we get there, I just want to tell you something about the Trinity. Do you remember when Jesus got baptized? Yep. Do you remember when Jesus got baptized? And So he's God the Son, right, for you theologians in the room. He's God the Son and then you've got God the Father and you've got God the Holy Spirit. 
The other two people in that little Trinity family, when Jesus gets baptized, they showed up for the event. You realize how important that is? They show up for the event and the Holy Spirit takes the form of a dove and goes and lands on Jesus to say, I affirm and believe in what he's doing right now. And then the voice of the father comes down from heaven and says, this is my beloved son whom I love in him. I'm well pleased. So he's mine and I love him and I'm a proud papa today. (laughs) Do you see how God speaks? God can't help but speak. God speaks the song that we sang earlier. You don't give your heart in pieces. You don't hide yourself to tease us. You don't give your heart in pieces. No, you give your whole heart. And again, some of us, it tweaks us a little bit because you're like, well, you're, you're saying that's my spiritual father, but my earthly father, he did kind of give his heart in pieces. Or my earthly mother kind of held back. God is different. By faith, you're going to follow him and you're going to experience him and you're going to believe a God that gives himself wholly to you. Matthew 16, verse 17. Jesus replied, you are blessed, Simon, son of John, because my father in heaven has revealed this to you. Now, this little scene here, this is Jesus and he's with the disciples and he said, do you know who I am? And are other people saying who I am? And and, and Peter is the one out of the pack of 12 disciples who says, we know you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And he speaks this amazing truth to Jesus. And Jesus said, the father revealed that to you. He says, you did not learn this from any human being. Verse 18. Now I say to you that you are Peter, which means rock. And upon this rock, I will build my church and the powers of hell will not conquer it. Amen. So he renames him kind of like Abraham. Why does he rename him? Well, Simon was his name. Simon means one who hears means a listener. If you've studied Peter's life, he's not so good at the listening part, right? He, he kind of runs right down the, the road and does his own thing and he misses Jesus a lot. So there's a little bit of a mislabeling thing that goes on there, just a little bit. And Jesus renames him rock, foundational stone actually. And he says, I'm gonna build my church on you and people like you, but you are a rock. And some of you guys know your Bibles and you know the same Peter that Jesus is saying this to, he's gonna deny Jesus how many times? Three times. On Jesus' worst day, Peter, the rock, is gonna get put on the spot and he's gonna deny his faith and deny his best friend. How do you call him rock? When Jesus, you know the future, you know this is about to happen. Here's why. Because Jesus calls things into existence before they are in existence. Jesus doesn't just look for perfection. He speaks vision over us because he sees the seed that is not yet the plant. It's the only way you can explain him calling Peter, Peter. Blessings speak vision, not perfection. Vision. That doesn't mean empty dream. Right? It doesn't mean wishful thinking. It means that Jesus speaks something that he sees, and sometimes we are way too slow to see it. So Gracie, my youngest, and I um, were on a rope course at a camp one time. And um, do we have that up there? Um, Got a little picture for you. There it is. We're the two in the center, looking all happy. Don't we look happy? This is before the hard stuff (laughs) happened. (laughs) So Gracie this year is actually graduated high school. She's on her way to OSU. Super proud of my girl. Yeah, she's she's awesome. Um, But yeah, this is years ago. We went to this father daughter camp, and it was amazing. And and they do things to try to make you uncomfortable, even terrify you, like get you up in heights. And even though you've got harnesses and stuff on, it's still gonna hurt if you fall. Can I 
can I just make sure you understand that? Because I was feeling it and I was feeling the nervousness of all this kind of stuff. And we were happy then, but in a minute, I wasn't going to be happy because what they did is they kind of draw you in. They kind of fake you out, right? Like they bring you and they like, they give you some easy things to do on the rope course to make you think that you got this thing. And the way that they do it too, like with the dads and the daughters is like, they make you all work together and you're all talking and, and the dads are being sometimes a little alpha male, sometimes. And like, I got this, I know how to solve this and all this kind of stuff. So do we have the second picture? Okay, so this is us in the middle of the final challenge. And do you see the guy in the back on the end? That's me, the guy who looks really worried and afraid. So, so this is the moment where they were like, okay, now here's what you're going to do. And they basically tied us up in knots as human beings and with all these ropes and there was no way out. And then what they did, the, the twist is they're like, and now the dads can't talk. You have to be silent for the whole rest of the challenge, which means you can't figure this out. You can't solve it and you can't command anybody to do anything. You're going to let the girls get you through this. Whoo! Again, you see the worry on my face there, right? <laughs> so here's what I ended up seeing. In the midst of all of this, as it went on, everybody starts to panic. Nobody can figure it out. And what Gracie Trueblood starts to do is she starts to take command. She starts to go to the other girls and what are your ideas? She picks the best one. She kind of gets consensus. And then she starts telling everybody what their job is going to be. And she tells us exactly, dad, you're going to put your leg here and you're going to stand here right at this moment. And she leads us, she talks us, narrates us through the entire thing over to the other side and she solves the whole thing. And I'm standing there like, what just happened? <laughs> and you know what just happened? Is I saw that my daughter was a born leader. Amen. Gifted. Capable. The shock is that I didn't know it before. Not that it's a race, but moments like that, you're like, man, God, how long ago did you see it? Because I can be a bit slow. I'm going to encourage you parents, speak blessing over your children and don't wait until it's a fully grown plant before you speak it. That God may tell you moms and dads and you grandmas and grandpas some big things about your kids before it's visible to anybody else, even you. Let him do that. Number 623. Tell Aaron and his sons to bless the people of Israel with this special blessing. This is, the Jewish people call this the Shema. This is the, the ancient priestly blessing. They would speak it over God's people on a regular basis. The blessing went like this. May the Lord bless you and protect you. May the Lord smile on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord show you his favor and give you peace. And whenever Aaron and his sons, that's, that's the class of priests, whenever they would bless the people of Israel in my name, I myself will bless them. So he comes to spiritual leaders in this community and he says, you need to bless my people and you need to say it out loud. You need to say it in their presence where they can hear you as a spiritual authority speak the words of blessing. And it's not a suggestion. He at no point in that verse says when you get around to it. Come on, somebody. He says, speak it. They need it. And then at the very end, he says, and when you speak it, I'm going to back it up. Amen. He says, when you, when you speak it, I myself will bless them. Now, why is that important? Because you're just a human being. I don't care who you've got authority over. You're just a human being. You can't actually bless anybody. But when you speak the words of blessing, what God says is the way I set it up, I'm going to come in and bring my power, bring my authority, and I'm going to make this thing happen. Because I want the act of blessing to happen. You write the check and God cashes it. Amen? Amen. That's the way it's supposed to work. So parents, we need to speak a blessing over our kids and we need to do it out loud. 
God gave you power to bless. We need to do it out loud. And we might be breaking generational sin to shut down the silence and to bring words in. Maybe. Married folks, you need to speak words of blessing over your spouse. It's not just parents. You need to bless each other. There's something powerful about in the home where no one else sees. We know things about each each other, do we not? And we need to speak the things that are seeds and that are not yet come to fruition in each other. And how do I get that about them? Well, I'm going to have to be hopeful and I'm going to have to be forgiving and I'm going to have to go to God and say, God, what did you put inside her or him? Yes? And then I'm going to have to speak it out loud and not wait. And you kids, which is everybody in this room, you're all a kid. You need to speak blessing to your parents, to your grown parents. You need to speak blessing to them. They need your words of encouragement. They need your words of life. And then anybody else who is in your village, do you know God gave you a circle of influence? He gave you people at work, in your neighborhood, he, people at your school, people here, right here in the church, maybe in, in youth group or in your life group or in, in your kids' room that you serve in. No, no matter where your circle of influence is, God needs you to speak to those people. Your words this week may be the only words of life they hear. Amen. Come on. Seek him for that. Romans 12, 9 through 10 says, don't just pretend to love others. Really love them. <laughs> it, come on, that's an amazing verse right there. Don't just pretend to love people. <laughs> I love that that's in our Bible. I, wh- wh- why is that in there? Because some of us are pretending, yes? What, what, what do you mean we're pretending? Are we mean people? It's, I don't think that's the point. I think, I think we speak a lot of loving words and we don't follow it up with loving action. I think we are too busy. I think we get stuck. I think we get intimidated. Don't just pretend to love, really love. Hate what is wrong, hold tightly to what is good, love each other with genuine affection and take delight in honoring each other. That take delight in honoring each other. I'm gonna give you the ESV on that, which is another Bible translation because I think it renders it better. Outdo one another in showing honor. Outdo one another. Now, I didn't just pick those words because it's the words that I liked. I looked at the Greek underneath, and the Greek is just not as good in the NLT. It's just not rendered into English as good. The, the, the literal Greek is, you should get out in front and show leadership. You should go first in leadership in showing honor to other people. How many of you know, whenever you come into a room with other people, somebody's got to go first? Especially the hard stuff. Somebody's got to go first. And the person who goes first is the leader. Doesn't matter who the ti- who's got the title, yes? It's the person who goes first as leader, saying, outdo one another, lead in showing honor to each other. This should be such a common aspect of the church of Jesus Christ that we are showing each other honor. It should look like a competition from the outside. It should look like we're trying to beat out somebody else. We're showing honor so much. I mean, that's the idea. Nobody in this church does this better, in my personal opinion, than Ricky Bustos, our youth pastor. When I came here to Grace Fellowship, um, I saw him in action. I'd never seen it before. He does this thing with people and does it all the time. He calls it an honor circle. And, and, and he gets people to kind of circle up around somebody who, who might be leaving or they're going through a, a big life change. And, and he puts them in the center. Everybody circles around them. And then you basically are supposed to speak to that person what you appreciate about them, what you see in them, what you've seen God do in their life. And you start saying the words out loud. The only person not to be in that situation is the last person to speak because all the good stuff has already been taken. But here's what's wonderful about it. As you're going around the circle, and people are speaking truth, by the way. You're not making stuff up. It's not Hallmark card time, right? Like the, these aren't just fancy dreams. Like we're, we're saying these are the things that we see actually in you. 
Sometimes the circle's going around it and I've been in it and I've got to say something and a lot of the good stuff has been taken and I'm like, oh Lord, oh Lord, you got to help me. You got to give me words to say. You've got to help me see some things that haven't been said yet. And you know that little desperate prayer in that little moment? Do you know God honors that prayer? And all of a sudden he starts to stir memories in you and stir things in you. Why? Because this is his heart. You're stepping into the role of the priestly class and saying, I'm going to bless you and God's going to back this up. It's what you're supposed to do. Outdo each other. Compete at it. It's an amazing thing when you see somebody go through one of Ricky Bustos' honor circles. Next verse. Colossians 1.27, honor is based on truth. To them, God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery. What is the mystery? It's kind of an evangelism verse. It's saying this mystery is being preached and it's going forward across the world. And what is the mystery? It's Christ in you, the hope of glory. Christ in you, the hope of glory. What, what does that mean? It means that When you reach out to Jesus Christ, you become a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. That's what the scripture says. You know what the new has come means? That means somehow your spiritual DNA just got turned upside down and recreated. The spirit of Jesus Christ came into you. And sometimes you like really let him have his day. And sometimes you hold him back and decide to walk in your own path, right? You walk in your old ways. But every time that you decide to let Jesus take the reins, take the wheel before it was a country song, whenever you decide to let him, the spirit of Christ that has been in you begins to reveal itself. That's glory. And the more you study his word and the more you speak to him, the more you walk with him, the more his glory, the more his presence that's already inside of you, it becomes brighter. It becomes more visible. Christ in you, the hope of glory. You've got way more inside of you than you ever dreamed you had inside of you. That's biblical truth. So when I say do honor circle and I say outdo each other in honor and call things out in each other, let me just settle you down for a second. I'm not asking you to fluff each other up with ego and pride. What I'm asking you to do is to see Jesus in each other. I just caught Jesus in you the other day. That's what you're doing, Christians. And he gets the glory for that, right? Because it's in, it's him in us, the hope of glory. Last verse, Hebrews 10, 24. Let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good works. And let us not neglect our meeting together as some people do, but encourage one another, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. I just wanted to give you that. Some of you studied that verse before, which is, and maybe you've missed that last line. We're supposed to encourage one another. And we're supposed to encourage one another more and more and more as our time goes out. Because Jesus is coming back. That's the day. The day of Jesus' return is coming. And when it comes, all of your relationships will fundamentally change. And there are things that you are called to do and to say while you are on this earth before his second coming. What, what the author of Hebrews is trying to tell us is time is ticking away. You've only got so much time. You'd better do it now. Amen? Amen? Amen. Okay, so take out your, take out your uh, inserts that they gave you at the door. And I hope you got one. Go ahead and grab the pen that's in the seat back in front of you. You are going to need to write. And for those of you who are like, are we going to take 30 seconds and pray and he's going to let me off the hook and I'm not going to have to do anything? Heck no. We're going to take minutes and minutes and minutes on this. And I'm going to put you on the spot. We're going to play music behind you. This is lab. Let's go. Right at the top. There's a spot for a name. And I want you to pray about the name of who you need to speak words of life over. I spoke to a guy after first service and he said he got the names of his two daughters from the Lord. And he wrote this whole thing out for his two daughters. You notice there's a front and a back side. So you got to do this twice. And that can be neighbors. It can be in your 
your village, right? In your church, it can be your parents. And I want you to think of who those two names are. Really what I want you to do is I want, to pray, want you to pray about who those two names should be. Because you might go to two easy people to encourage. God may have deeper things for you today. So what I want you to do right now is I want you to pray just silently to yourself, Jesus Christ, speak those two names to me. And I'll admit to you, I fully understand that some of you have never sensed God speaking to you in the past. And so this is a big deal to you. But trust him, have faith that he'll speak those names. He might put a picture in your mind. He might nudge you, might lead you. Just pray. Write those names down. You might get the name of somebody who you have a broken relationship with or a strained relationship with or a distant relationship with. If the Lord spoke that name to you, trust him. Trust him in that. My desire is for this to be a distraction-free environment. If you would, just try to get your phones under your chair or something like that. If your spouse is sitting next to you, do not nudge them. Do not look at their sheet. Just let them be with the Lord right there in their chair, okay? Okay, the first question, and this is on your screens as well. This is the thing I love most. What I love most, what I appreciate most, cherish most about you, value most in you, or I just enjoy this. I just enjoy this aspect of you. Write those down for your two names. Maybe you got three things, maybe you got four things. Maybe you got two things, that's okay. Some of you are just gonna write a single word down. Maybe it's a full sentence, that's okay. Awesome. Love it. God's speaking all across this room. He's guiding you. Let's go on to the next one. What I admire most, this might sound a little bit like the first one, but it's it's just meant to evoke some different stuff out of you for them. What I admire most, what I respect most about you, what I believe about you, believe in you. And these are the things I rely on you for. Write them down.
folks online, you really need to do this exercise with us. You're not off the hook. Don't let this moment pass you by. Don't tell yourself you'll do it later. Do it now. Last one, the thing that I wish you knew, the thing I should have told you, the thing I should have explained, if I just had five more minutes with you, if I just had five more minutes with you, this is the thing I would say. Still got some pens that are just moving so fast. I love it. I'm going to go ahead and wrap this up. Would you guys go ahead and stand? I just invite you that if you've got more to write, more to say, our next service doesn't start till 1145. It's 20 minutes from now. You're, you're welcome to let everybody else out of the room and sit right back down and finish up what God's given you. These are big. Do not leave that sheet of paper here. Don't forget it. Don't put it in the seat back in front of you. Don't put it under your chair. That is a solid gold sheet of paper. Amen? That that paper should become a letter for you to write to them. That paper, if it's not a letter, it should become a conversation that you have with them or a a coffee that you sit down and you say those words face to face to them. Our words give life, amen? They're meant to give life.